I feel like the series just got announced yesterday and now it's over and I don't know what to do with my life anymore. <laughs> What's up everybody? So today I am here to discuss my thoughts and opinions on Ship of the Dead, the third and final book in the Magnus Chase and the Gods of Asgard trilogy by Rick Riordan. I'm gonna jump right into it and just say that since this is the third book in the series, there are going to be spoilers abound in this video. There's really no way I can avoid it, so if you haven't read the book, which I know it literally just came out less than 48 hours ago, so a lot of people haven't read it, click away now and come back once you finish the book because I do not want to spoil anyone, but I have a lot to talk about. So let's get started. I was writing all my notes on this in class because I was like sitting in the parking lot at school reading it. Like it was it was ridiculous. I went to like six stores to find it yesterday. I I <laughs> I was so excited about this book, and now it's over, and I'm upset. I'm gonna start with the elephant in the room, Magnus and Alex, holy crap. Oh my gosh. I am so happy. I mean, obviously we saw it coming. It was very, it was hinted at a lot in Hammer of Thor and in the beginning of this book. I'm so glad Rick Riordan went through with it. I'm very happy that he made it so that it's very clear that despite Alex being gender fluid, Magnus is still attracted to her slash him in whichever gender that he's expressing that day. And it's just... <sighs> that kind of representation and that kind of story should be available to kids this way. And like, this is the first kind of story we've seen like this in a young adult or middle grade book. And I'm just so happy that it happened. And also, their seasons, like, they're just so cute like that one scene where he's healing her during the um fight with the giant he just sees her memories like he's expecting to see some kind of like violent memory about her past or something and instead he just sees her admiring him at the dinner table like that's like the one prominent memory in her mind at the moment like oh my gosh how adorable is that I talked about in my Rick Riordan book collection video about how I sticky note some of my books after I deal through a reread of them and I couldn't help but put in two sticky notes in this one while I was reading it so I could bookmark the two kiss scenes so I could go back and read them because they were so adorable. <laughs> also, speaking of Alex Fierro, like obviously we know that she has been through a lot. She's alluded to her past even though we really haven't seen it. And I like that in this book we got a lot more of that. We got one flashback with her dad and we got a lot more about her family history and basically how her pottery skill isn't just a hobby but it's actually a family skill that's been passed down for a few generations and that it's part of her heritage and everything like that was just really really interesting because a lot of the things like a lot of Alex's little quirks we kind of just thought they were just like little silly things like the whole wearing green and pink all the time and the pottery like we just thought that was just one of her quirks but it turns out it was something a lot more important and I like that it was given a much deeper meaning you know I absolutely adore every single character in these books. Like, obviously they all have their flaws. Mallory kind of has her anger issues. Um, TJ is very socially awkward. He still does not really fit in with the 21st century. He's very caught up in his past. Alex obviously has her issues with dealing with her past and overcoming that. Magnus obviously is still dealing with still, I mean, all of his family drama and his homelessness and still overcoming that like everyone has a kind of tortured past that they're getting over but they don't necessarily have to get over their issues or like become a better person for them to be likable they can still be these amazing characters and still have like huge flaws like Mallory tried to bomb a bus and like TJ killed the dude repeatedly for like 30 years because he couldn't get over his grudge and it was just like they're obviously very, very flawed people, and they did things in the past that they regret that they have kind of kept secret until now. And I'm glad that these things kind of came to light, because it doesn't... They don't seem just like a perfect, like, fighting sidekick team for Magnus. They all have their own internal issues that kind of mirror his, and they all come together because they can understand each other's issues and realize that it can make them stronger, rather than letting the things in their past destroy who they are. Also, just Magnus's character in general, not necessarily his development, because he has pretty much stayed the same person since the first book, but I like that his character came out in the final battle against Loki, because really, in the even from the first book, like right away, it was clear that Magnus wasn't a fighting type. He was very much more of, I mean, obviously, his power from his dad. He's a healer, he's support, he's protective, he's more of... He's less of a fighter and more of 
a doer, if that makes sense. Like, he doesn't aim to destroy the problem, he aims to fix it. And that really, really shows in the final battle because he takes down Loki through his his power of loving his friends and adoring and caring for the people around him. Like, even in the beginning, whenever he was training with Percy, it was clear that he wasn't doing the training right, he was failing at every task because he's not a fighter, he's not the kind of person who's going to charge into battle at the front and, like, start slashing down his enemies. He's the kind of person who will stand at the side and talk people down and help those who were injured. And that just really, really was... I mean, amazing and stay true to his character in the end that he didn't have to fight anyone or hurt anyone to take down the big bad. And also just, it's very different from Rick Riordan's past writing where it's always like a huge battle in the end. Everyone's throwing down enemies back and forth and everyone has to like fight side by side. Whereas Magnus never had to pull out a weapon other than for moral support. I mean, <laughs> when, when you have a talking sword singing 80 songs in your ear, that can really, really help in a battle, obviously. <laughs> But Magnus has never ever used his sword to hurt another enemy unless absolutely necessary. And that just is a really unique and interesting approach to a character in a series and a universe where pretty much everyone always depends on being the strongest fighter. I'm also really, really glad that Rick Riordan doesn't hold back in the Magnus Chase series. Obviously, the subject matter and the themes are all very, very mature. There's a little more swearing in this series. There, he's very upfront about mentioning things like death and suicide and LGBT issues. He hasn't glossed over it or hasn't been vague about it whatsoever. He's been very forward about it, even in the final chapter of this book where he had Magnus and Alex open up the homeless shelter for teens. Like, that was like an amazing thing. I teared up reading that last chapter because it really shows Rick Riordan's progression as an author being able to talk about these more serious issues and bring them to light for an audience that might not necessarily have that in any other sort of media. And it just makes me really, really happy to see those kinds of things in a middle grade book. I think I have a love-hate relationship with the way that Rick Riordan is weaving his series into one another. I mean, we saw that just a little bit while Percy Jackson and Kane Chronicles were going on at the same time. There were references to one another but the stories didn't interweave too much. Whereas now with Magnus Chase and Trials of Apollo, they're taking place simultaneously and the characters are interacting between the series. Obviously, Annabeth and Percy were in Ship of the Dead, both the, at the beginning and at the end. And we saw hints of what's going to happen in the third Trials of Apollo book, In the Burning Maze, from Annabeth and Magnus's conversation at the end of Ship of the Dead. And I'm not sure if I like it or if I'm just frustrated because now it's like, man, I really, really want Burning Maze to come out. And it's almost disappointing because I know that the Magnus Chase trilogy is over, but I also know, just knowing Rick Riordan, we're going to see Magnus and Alex and everyone again because of the way the stories are interweaved. This isn't the last we're going to see of them, and we are going to know more. I mean, we already do know more about the Trials of Apollo series and what's going on while we're not there because of the way he interweaves it into Ship of the Dead, which is really, really interesting. Also, I'm kind of scared because... I thought of a reason why Annabeth might be crying at the end of Ship of the Dead. Because remember a certain satyr friend of ours popped up at the end of Dark Prophecy? And they were heading to California? And now Annabeth's upset? I can't help but think that something happened. And I'm, I'm not... I'm not excited about that. I'm not... I'm not happy. I need, I'm very scared about what's going to happen. So good job, Rick. You got me You got me to buy our next book in Trials of Apollo. I was going to do it anyway, but congrats. You got me to really want it now. Throughout this whole trilogy, Magnus talks about how he's not an affectionate person, and then throughout this book, his whole goal is so that he can get the meads, so he can win the flight against Loki, because without it, he's not a good enough speaker, and he's not going to win. But honestly, just... When I read this paragraph from his perspective about Alex, like, I was just like, that is a lie. And you know it. You... Like, his feelings are so strong that, like, he didn't... This was before he drank the mead, before he had his godly speaking ability granted to him from it. And just... Hold on. I also kept thinking about Alex Fierro. You know, maybe just a little. Alex was a force of nature, like the snow thunder. She struck when she felt like it, depending on temperature differentials and storm patterns I couldn't possibly predict. She shook my foundations in a way that was powerful, but also weirdly soft and constrained, veiled in blizzard. I couldn't assign any motives to her. 
she just did what she wanted. At least that's how it felt to me. Like that, <laughs> that is the most cheesy romantic poetic thing I've ever read in my life. And this is coming from the boy who says that he's not good with affection and not good with feelings. Like, okay, okay, Magnus, all right, sure. Um, some final points. I like that he broke up Mallory and Halfborn for this book because that dynamic was hilarious and also kind of like the greatest thing ever. Like, because Rick's never had a couple break up in their books be in his books before. He's always had them get together and stick together through thick and thin. I, go I get that Leo, Leo and Calypso in Dark Prophecy kind of had some rocky times, but they didn't break up, whereas Mallory and Halfborn did, and that was a fun dynamic probably for him to explore and for us to read. Samira Al Abbas is my wife. She's not. She's Amir's wife in the future, but you know what? I love her anyway. She is the strongest character I have read about in a long time. I admire her so much. Oh my gosh. And I'm so happy that Rick also included details about Ramadan and fasting and all of her prayers because, again, it just brings awareness to things that a lot of the young readers who don't belong to this faith may not necessarily understand, and it's just so well done on his part. Hearthstone and Blitzen need to be protected. I know that they're like adults and they need to do what they want, but I just need to like wrap them in a blanket and hide them somewhere because they have gone through so much, especially Hearth. Hearth, Hearth, I don't... However you may pronounce that, I still have trouble with it. Especially Hearth having to deal with, like, you know, killing his own dad and everything. Especially after everything he just went through in Hammer of Thor, having to go back to that place and see his brother's ghost and, like, kill his dad, like, dad dragon thing. Like, that... Oh my gosh, please protect, please protect this elf, someone, please. All in all, besides, you know, all the rambling I just did, my number one point that I want to make is that I am going to miss this trilogy and these characters so much. I know, knowing Rick Riding, we will see them again, but it won't be the same. It may not be a story focused on Magnus, but we will see him in the future, and I cannot wait for that day because he has definitely become one of my favorite Rick Riding characters of all time. I adored these books, I adored this trilogy, I adored Ship of the Dead, and it was my favorite book in this trilogy, and I cannot wait to see what Rick Riordan does with his books in the future, and as we all can probably guess, I will be supporting him in all of his future writing endeavors, and I will be doing more thoughts and reviews on his books in the future, so stay tuned for that. Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoy listening to me talk about books, you can click over here on my face to subscribe, as well as you can click down here to see my video that I did on my Rick Riordan book collection. It was really, really fun going through all those. I had some signed books and some special editions and some interesting stuff that I went through over there. And now I get to add Ship of the Dead to that pile, so maybe one day in the future if Rick keeps putting out books the way he does, I'll have to do an update on that. What are you doing? What? Hello? Hi. Hello, I'm trying to film a video. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you all later. Bye. Stop.